provides from the beginning of the lawsuit, the rules of the court allow the attorneys to make brief opening statements. Uh, Mr. Zelling, I believe you are going to speak on behalf of the state. The jury is with you, sir. I hurt her. I hurt her bad. She's dead. Those are the words of Amanda Hayes to her own sister. Those are the words of Amanda Hayes six days after Laura Ackerson came over to the apartment that she shared with Grant Hayes. Um, those are the words of Amanda Hayes hours before she and Grant Hayes deposited Laura's body in a Texas creek. Those were the words of Amanda Hayes six days before Laura Ackerson's severed torso would be found. I hurt her. I hurt her bad. She's dead. Now, I want to thank you for, for sitting through that arduous jury selection process. And as the judge told you, this is an opening statement. This is a forecast of what that evidence will be. And, um, I, got, I had the opportunity to talk to some of you during jury selection. My name is Bob Zellinger. And I'm an assistant district attorney here in Wake County, along with Becky Holt, who represents the state of North Carolina. And I want you to take, pay close attention to the fact that what the judge told you is that the evidence will come from this witness stand. And people are going to come up here and swear to tell you the truth. And they're going to tell you about what they saw and what they heard. And from that story, you're going to learn that on July 13th of 2011, Laura Ackerson woke up excited. She was a 27-year-old mother of two little boys, Gentle and Grant IV, and she shared custody of those two little boys with Amanda Hayes' husband, Grant Hayes. You'll hear that Grant Hayes and Laura Ackerson had been in a relationship together and that these two boys had been born, and then Grant Hayes left Laura for Amanda Hayes, an actress that she met, that Grant met in the U.S. Virgin Islands. But you hear that there was a pretty contentious custody dispute between um, Amanda and Grant and Laura. And you'll hear a lot about that dispute. You'll hear how there was a, a custody schedule set up where Grant and Amanda had custody of these two little boys from Monday through Friday, and that they would meet Laura at a Sheets gas station in Wilson, North Carolina, which is pretty close to where Grant and Amanda lived in Raleigh, and Laura lived in, in uh, Kinston, North Carolina. And so they would meet at that gas station to exchange the kids, and then on Sunday night they would do the same thing to exchange the kids. And you'll hear that Laura was excited because finally things were going her way in this custody dispute. Laura had been um, a part of this custody evaluation that was conducted by Dr. Ginger Calloway, someone who the court had appointed to determine who should get custody in, in this litigation that was pending in Kinston, North Carolina. And you'll hear that the custody evaluation made Laura feel pretty good about her chances to get custody back. You'll hear that Laura was excited and she walked out of her apartment. You'll see that she walked past the refrigerator covered with pictures of those little boys. And you'll see that her apartment in Kinston um, had a huge space devoted to those little boys, just like a huge part of her life was devoted to those little boys. You're going to hear from one of her business associates, Siobhan Mathis, who's actually one of her best friends. You're going to hear Siobhan talk about how Laura and her business was finally getting going and that Laura had a couple business meetings that day on July 13th. And you'll hear that their business, which is called Go Fish, um, sold restaurant menus to restaurants. And they're the kind that have the advertising down the sides. And so they would go to these restaurants and provide the menus for free and, and sell the advertising to other folks. And you'll hear out that on the afternoon of July 13th, Laura went to some of these meetings to talk to various restaurateurs around Kinston. Um, you'll hear that she had a meeting at 2 o'clock, and then you'll hear that she had a meeting at 4 o'clock with Randy Jenkins from Bill's Grill, which is pretty close to um, Wilson. Pay close attention to how um, Mr. Jenkins describes Laura. And the, the fulgence that she demonstrates, how she's very excited because that night she's going to get to see her boys. And you hear that Laura seeing her boys in the middle of the week was a pretty unusual practice, but for some reason she had been invited by Grant to come over to that apartment that Wednesday night. And you'll hear that Laura left that meeting at 4 or 4.15 from Bill's Grill and headed right into the teeth of Raleigh traffic on that Wednesday night. And at 4.19 p.m. she called one of her friends. Oksana Samarski. You're going to hear from Oksana. And you're going to get to hear that voicemail. And it's chilling to listen to because you're going to be able to hear the uncertainty in Laura's voice as she talks about how she doesn't know exactly what's going to happen when she goes over to Grant's house. 
You're then going to hear that she makes another phone call at 4.59 p.m. to Grant Hayes' phone that he and Amanda Hayes share. You're going to hear that that phone call at 4.59 p.m. on Wednesday, July 13th, bounces off a cell phone tower over by Crabtree Valley Mall, uh, the intersection of Beltline and, and 70 mm -hmm. Glenwood Avenue. You're going to hear that Grant lived further down 70, outbound, away from downtown. And you'll be able to see the distance between that location where her cell phone bounced off the tower and where Grant lived and where she was going. And you'll see that it's just a couple minutes away. And then you're going to find out that Laura went over to that apartment and disappeared. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a case, it's not just about a crime, it's an inhumane crime. This is a case about the killing of a human being and the barbarities and brutalities that Amanda Hayes and Grant Hayes exerted on her body such that she disappeared off the face of the earth for 11 days. So Laura heads over to, to Grant and Amanda's house that Wednesday night, and no one hears from her again. Meanwhile, at 9.42 that evening, you're gonna see some video and some evidence that Amanda Hayes goes to a Chick-fil-A over on Glenwood Avenue, again, outbound on 70 near that house. Nearly four hours after Laura entered Grant and Amanda's apartment. And you're gonna see um, Amanda at that Chick-fil-A with the two little boys, Laura's children, and also Amanda's little girl. For Amanda, a month earlier, it had a, an infant named Lily and that Grant was the father of. And you're gonna see Amanda go to that Chick-fil-A and buy four meals. And you'll learn the significance of that. And you'll learn that later that night, at around 1.12 a.m., Grant Hayes makes a purchase at a gas station. You'll learn that at 1.27 and 1.29 a.m., over on Peace Street near Glenwood, that he has an ATM withdrawal. And you'll hear that at 2 a.m. that night, Grant Hayes walks into the Walmart in Briar Creek. And you'll see the amount of time that Grant Hayes is out of that apartment. And presumably, Amanda and those children and Laura is left there. And you'll hear that Grant walked into that Walmart and purchased a 9 by 12 foot plastic tarp. You'll hear that he bought some goggles, a couple pairs of gloves, hefty contractor extra large garbage bags, and perhaps most importantly, you'll hear that Grant Hayes purchased a skill reciprocating saw with six inch blades. And then he also bought it some additional blades for that reciprocating saw. And you're going to get to see one of those reciprocating saws. And it's going to be very clear to you what the purpose was for those purchases. And you're going to have to estimate it and listen closely to the amount of time that, again, Amanda Hayes is at home alone with the kids and presumably Laura's body. You're going to learn that she had a cell phone there. Then you're going to hear about the next morning. On July 14th, Siobhan, Laura's good friend, doesn't hear from her. And she starts getting worried. You'll hear about how her worry grows and grows. Meanwhile, you'll find out that Amanda Hayes called her daughter Shay. Now, Shay is, Amanda has one daughter, Lily, who's around a month old. And you'll hear about Shay, who's around 20 years old at this time. And you'll hear that Amanda asked her daughter to come over to this apartment and take the kids out of the house all day. And you'll hear that these children um, go to a uh, establishment called Monkey Joe's with Shay. And Monkey Joe's is apparently like a, a playground indoors um, for, for children. That Shay's there nearly all day with these kids, as Amanda has asked her to keep these kids out of the house. You'll hear that when Shay comes back to that apartment, Amanda has another chore for her. She makes her go all the way home and pick up a vacuum cleaner and bring it back to Amanda's house because Amanda and Grant's vacuum cleaner has broken. You're going to hear that on July 15th, Siobhan Mathis's um, concern grows and grows and grows, and she actually emails Laura, and you'll get to see what that email is. And you'll hear that Siobhan asks, are, are you okay? Did you lose your cell phone? Something along those lines. It's been two days now since she's heard from a business partner and friend. And you'll hear that while she's worrying and sending those emails, Grant Hayes, that afternoon at 12.50, goes to Walmart and buys some duffel bags. And then later in that day, at 4.30, this is Friday, July 15th, that's when this custody exchange is supposed to happen. So you'll hear that, and you'll see Grant Hayes go to the Sheets gas station for hours. And you'll see him outside on the phone. Pay close attention to who he's calling at that time. 
And again, you'll hear that Amanda Hayes is at home alone with her baby and Laura Ackerson's body. After Grant stays at that custody exchange and shockingly, Laura doesn't show up, you'll hear that he leaves and, and comes back. And Saturday, more concern grows for Siobhan. Meanwhile, Grant and Amanda Hayes are around town buying more items, three bags of ice, multiple coolers. Pay close attention to where those coolers end up. You'll also hear that Grant and Amanda ask Shay's husband for help installing a trailer hitch onto their Dodge Durango. And you're also going to hear something interesting, that Amanda Hayes on that Friday called her sister Karen Berry and said, hey, guess what? I'm going to come to Texas. You'll hear that Karen's kind of surprised by this, but is like, OK? And you'll hear that their mother had died a, a month previous to this, and, or two months earlier, and that Karen presumed that that was the reason that Amanda was going to drive 1,200 miles down to Texas. They hear that Saturday that Amanda calls Shay and lets Shay know that they're going to be moving to Kinston that weekend, and they also might be going to Texas. And you'll have to peer through all these statements that Amanda makes to her family about going to Texas. But you hear that the preparations for Texas continue, and that Amanda and Grant, uh, eventually Grant heads to the U-Haul facility over here and buys um, a U, or rents a U-Haul trailer to drag behind that Durango. And you're going to get to see his demeanor in that U-Haul facility. You might hear from someone in that U-Haul facility. And you'll see Grant on the phone again, again, more time, where Amanda Hayes is at home with her cell phone, by herself, with the children, and presumably Laura's body. On Sunday, July 17th, you'll hear that Siobhan's fear has just grown and grown and grown. And she, at that point, calls and, and emails Laura and sends her an email that says, if you don't respond back to me, I'm going to contact the police. Siobhan actually contacts other folks to find out if Laura picked up the children on Friday, because she knows that those children are the most important thing in Laura Ackerson's life. But she finds out that Laura didn't pick up those children, and she instantly knows something's wrong, bad wrong. Meanwhile, Grant and Amanda are renting a hotel in Montgomery, Alabama, hours and hours away from North Carolina. You'll hear that their cell phones have been off this entire time. And as Sunday turns into Monday, July 18th, you'll hear that Siobhan walks into the Kinston Police Department and reports her friend missing. And Detective Jamie Gortney picks up the case. You'll hear what he does. He talks to Siobhan. He talks to other of Laura's friends. And he tries to figure out what has happened to Laura. Maybe she just took off someplace. He's, he's trying to find out. And as his investigation continues, meanwhile, in Texas, 1,200 miles away, at 5 AM, Grant and Amanda show up with the three children trailing a, with a trailer attached to their Durango. And you'll find out that Karen's surprised to see them, but excited to see her sister. And meanwhile, Detective Gordon is contacting local restaurants, trying to figure out who Laura has been with. You'll, You'll see the um, video from Laura's apartment complex where she exits that morning. And you'll find out that when she exited that morning from her apartment complex, she walked out to her white Ford Focus. And you'll hear that a bolo is issued for that white Ford Focus for law enforcement officers to be on the lookout for this car. And you know that Detective Gordon continues in his investigation. And at this point, the Kinston Police Department is concerned about Laura Ackerson. Her, her friends and family are concerned about her. She has a brother that lives in Wake Forest and some family up in Michigan. Everyone's growing more and more concerned. And you'll hear at this point when the bolo is released, everyone in the triangle is worried about her. And media reports about where is this car. So Detective Borgney hears about all these custody issues and decides to contact Grant Hayes. Pay close attention to what Grant Hayes tells Detective Borgney. You're going to hear this testimony. You're going to hear that Grant Hayes said that Laura came over to their apartment at 6.40 that day. And you'll be able to compare that to the cell phone records and what time you think she arrived there. <laughs> you'll hear that Grant stated that Laura left with the boys and then came back to the apartment around 9 or 9.30, and that she left around 10 p.m. You'll hear that Grant also tells Detective Bordney that they're moving to Kinston, but he wants to send Detective Bordney some emails, some correspondence between Laura and Grant. You'll hear that he says that he has to wait until he gets into better coverage because he's out in the boonies. And Detective Gordon will tell you that he thought this was kind of odd since um, he didn't really think that Raleigh was out in the boonies or had boonies. 
But you'll hear that Gren is telling him these things while sitting next to Amanda Hayes in that Durango. You'll hear that the most interesting part of what Grant tells Detective Borney, which is that when Laura arrived, that Amanda took the children and kept them in another room. And you'll think about that. And you'll also hear that Grant told Detective Borney that, that Laura had come over to discuss an agreement where Laura was going to keep the kids. So Tuesday, July 19th comes up again. The Kinston Police Department is trying to find Laura. And at this point, Detective Gordon comes to Raleigh since he learns that this is the last place that Laura was seen and briefs members of the Raleigh Police Department. You'll hear from the, some of those folks in the Raleigh Police Department homicide unit. <coughs> and you'll hear what they did after they got this information. Meanwhile, in Texas, you'll learn that Amanda Hayes that morning sits down with her sister and utters those words. I hurt her. I hurt her bad. She's dead. You're going to hear from Amanda's sister, Karen Berry. And you're going to hear about her. You're going to be able to judge her demeanor and, and hear um, about the, the context of this conversation. You'll hear that later that day, Amanda takes some money out of an ATM and that she and Grant end up purchasing a 32-gallon trash can, four boxes of muriatic acid, and a couple pairs of gloves. <coughs> now in Raleigh, Again, the question is rising, where is Laura? The bolo has been issued, everybody's searching for Laura. And as the sun sets, you'll hear that in Texas, 1,200 miles away, Amanda Hayes and Grant Hayes go on a boat trip. Across the street from <coughs> Karen Berry's house, there's a cut through to a little creek called Oyster Creek. You're gonna get to see this creek. You're gonna get to see the boat that they went in. It's a, a 12 foot John boat. You're, you're gonna get to see where they sat in that boat. You'll hear that they went out on that boat on a nighttime fishing expedition, which seemed pretty odd to the folks down there. Around that time that they went out on that boat, you'll hear that the Raleigh Police Department finds Laura's car. And they find that car in an apartment complex, in a parking space that's not 400 yards from where Amanda and Grant Hayes live. You'll hear that Grant and Amanda return off this evening boat trip and all of a sudden, there's several coolers around Karen Berry's property. Pay close attention to those coolers. You'll hear that after detectives find this car in such close proximity to Amanda Hayes' apartment, that they immediately execute a search warrant in the Grand Amanda's apartment. And when they go in there, right by the front door, there's a big bleach spot. And you'll hear more about that bleach spot. And you'll hear that there's also another bleach spot next to one of the bathrooms. And that it appears that bleach has leaked out from underneath the corners of the door there. And you'll get to see pictures of that bathroom. And you'll learn that that bathroom was very, very clean, cleaner than any other room in the house. And you'll learn that there are some things missing from that bathroom. Shay will testify that missing from that bathroom is a, a shower rod, a shower curtain, bath mats. Those are all gone. And you'll wonder where they went. You'll hear that later on that day, um, detectives from the Raleigh Police Department continue their investigation after they execute that search warrant. And you'll hear that um, all roads at this point are, are leading them to Texas. You'll find out that they pinged Grant Hayes' phone, the phone that he shared with Amanda Hayes. And what that means is, and you'll learn about this technology, that through the phone company, they're able to find the GPS coordinates of that phone. And you'll see where those GPS coordinates come off. And that Tuesday, it ends up right in the backyard of Karen Berry. And then that Wednesday, you'll hear that, again, Amanda talks to her sister Karen Berry, and Karen, as Amanda's saying that she's leaving to come back to North Carolina because she has to meet with Laura, which Karen finds odd based on everything else that's happened down there, you'll hear that at that point, Karen asks Amanda, are you covering for granted? And Amanda, on her way out the door, nods her head. Pay close attention to the context of those conversations and how the day before Amanda Hayes had told Karen, I hurt her, I hurt her bad, she's dead. So at that point, you'll hear that detectives leave North Carolina and two homicide detectives from the Raleigh Police Department, Detective Dexter Gill, and Detective Bobby Latour, head to Texas and, and they drive down there. They leave on that Friday evening. 
You'll hear that at the same time, that Wednesday, Amanda and Grant take the U-Haul trailer back to the U-Haul facility in Texas, and then they start driving back towards North Carolina. And like ships passing in the night on that Friday, as detectives head to Texas, Grant and Amanda arrive back in North Carolina. And you'll hear that at that point, a search warrant is executed on them. Pay close attention to what's taken. There's some digital evidence. Pay close attention to that. Meanwhile, detectives drive through the night and arrive in Texas at, on, the, on the Saturday evening. And at that point, they go to sleep and wake up the next Sunday morning and head to Karen Berry's house. Now at this point, Grant and Amanda have had uh, a five-day head start on Raleigh police detectives. And they sit down with Karen Berry. And you'll hear about Karen's demeanor and how she prayed before talking with them. And you'll hear how Karen tells them about some of the things that occurred, about how Karen walked around the property with Grant and Amanda as Grant and Amanda asked if there was a septic tank or a hole someplace or a river looking for some, some deep place. And you'll hear also that Karen told them, I can't stand the thought of standing in court and facing my sister after this, but I've got to do what's right. Please take care of her when you pick her up, please. And you'll hear that Karen then tells more of this story. And she'll come on this witness stand and tell you more about it. And at that point, the question in detectives' heads of where is Laura is leading them across the street from Karen Berry's house. And you'll hear that they call some other investigators from the Fort Bend County Sheriff's Office to go across that street into that river. And you'll see that that creek, it's called Oyster Creek, is covered with vines and foliage. You know, the water is 89 degrees. And you'll hear from uh, investigator Kim Oreskovich, who takes a boat out, out into that river with a Richmond Fire Department member. And there, for all of Laura's family and friends, for Siobhan, for the Kinston Police Department, for folks in the Triangle, for the Raleigh Police Department, there our first worst fears are realized. For there, in the middle of that creek, lies Laura Ackerson's severed torso. Her head has been cut off. Her arms have been cut off. Her torso is split in half. You'll hear the efforts that these investigators take to pull these body parts out of the water. And you'll hear that later on that Sunday night, Amanda and Grant Hayes are both arrested in Kinston. You know, they hear how the next day, part of Laura's leg is found. And later on, detectives from, or uh, I'm sorry, members of the Houston dive team find Laura's decapitated head. Pay close attention to the testimony about Laura's head. You're going to hear, and you're going to, you might see some pictures of the area, but listen to the testimony about that and how the condition of that head differs from the rest of her body. You're going to hear from several folks um, from Texas, including the medical examiner down there, Dr. Navi Mambo, who performs a first autopsy on these body parts. And then you'll hear that Laura's body was returned home to North Carolina. And then when it came back here to North Carolina, it was taken to the North Carolina Medical Examiner's Office, led by Dr. Debbie Radish. And you're going to hear her testify. You're also going to hear from Dr. Ginger Calloway, who did that custody evaluation between Grant and Amanda. Pay close attention to her testimony. This whole time you'll wonder, who could do this to Laura? Who could do such an inhumane thing as murdering someone and then cutting them apart? You'll get to see Laura's diary. Laura's diary where she states that Amanda calls her psycho crazy, that Amanda looks at her with disdain, that Amanda says, I'm now responsible for your kids because you're psycho crazy. You're also going to see in that diary many things about Grant Hayes and the bitter, contentious custody dispute that Amanda and Grant were having with Laura Ackerson. You also hear that Laura writes in there, I'm afraid to approach the subject with Grant and Amanda. They act as though I don't exist. And the whole time, you'll be wondering, who would want to do this and make Laura disappear for 11 days? You'll hear Laura wrote, I've done nothing to Amanda, but to them I am psycho crazy. It's dirt and discouraging to deal with them about my children. Ladies and gentlemen the jury, you're going to hear about how this custody dispute grew more and more contentious. You're going to hear how angry and resentful Amanda and Grant were 
that Laura Ackerson was calling them every day and emailing them, trying to get in touch with her children. This isn't going to be a trial where we attempt to determine who struck the fatal blow or who cut Laura's arms off, who cut her legs off, who cut her head off. You're going to hear more about the 11 days between the time that Laura went over to Grand Amanda's house and when she disappeared off the face of the earth. You're going to hear more about the six days between the time that she went over to Grand Amanda's house and Grand and Amanda went out in that boat ride. You're going to hear more about the bitter custody dispute, and you're going to learn that on July 13th of 2011, there were three adults in that apartment. One is dead, one has been tried for murder, and the other one is here before you. You're going to learn that Amanda Hayes is an actress, that she trained as an actress, that she performed as an actress, and that she attempted to make a living as an actress. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't a case about movies, and this isn't a movie. This isn't a stage. This is a case about a murdered young mother, the two young boys that will never see her again, and the role that Amanda Hayes had in her death. Thank you. All right. Questions? Do you have remarks?